Uh, this is Priscilla Almquist Olson, host of today for a very interesting interview with a multi talented guest, Peter Yolanis uh, from uh, Rhode Island. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, a Greek who has delved into his history, his heritage, and uh, also serves veterans. Oh, let's turn so. to. Um, your uh, background and uh, your family history and yes. so forth. Uh, we, you know, we had the Pope coming to visit mm -hmm. uh, here, and he talked about uh, himself as uh, the son of an immigrant. Yes. And today I learned that his parents were Italian who emigrated to Argentina. Yes. So now it's quite understandable why his Italian is so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and perhaps... One of the reasons he was uh, elected pope, but uh, I think there are other, many more important reasons uh, for that. And he is just a, a very humble and wonderful person. And I think he's touched the hearts of so many people of different faiths uh, because yes. he's, he reaches into the hearts and, uh, uh, you know, and, and humanity. I mean, right. that's, that's the, 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 he's embracing humanity. Uh, so... Um, you're uh, a child of immigrants. I am. And why don't you tell us uh, about that sure. a bit? And that'll frame your interest in Greek history and so forth. So let's hear about your heritage. Okay. I was born in Bristol, Connecticut, my hometown, where my dad had a restaurant for years. Both my mom and dad were from the old country, the old country of Greece. Yes, and, and I understand it was not a Greek restaurant. No, it's not. <laughs> it wasn't. Actually, my mother did all the Greek cooking at home. But in any event, I, I like to refer to them as not only Greek Orthodox, which was, you know, that's the, the main religion, speaking of the Pope, whose trip was just extraordinary. I was one of those who was truly touched by, by what he had to say. Um, but I call them not, not just the Greek Orthodox, but Greek off the docks. Because they came off the docks in Ellis Island. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> in the 1920s. And as so many immigrants, you know, went through that whole process. Mm. My dad was one of uh, five children. Um, uh, and he was born in a very small village in Greece that had maybe 50 people in there. And his, his father um, was actually a farmer, but he was also a musician uh, and was a drummer. Um, had a little, you know, this, this Greek band that would play for weddings and uh, baptisms and so forth in this village. And I understand you're a drummer. Yes, I am. But I didn't realize this until n not too long ago when my sister said to me, did you know that the grandpa was a drummer? And I said, no. As a matter of fact, uh, after a, a gig um, at, at, I think it was a, uh, a baptism, uh, on a summer's day, he came back and sat at the edge of a well uh, and got a drink and, and unfortunately caught a chill and died of pneumonia shortly after that. And he was a young man. He was in his 30s. My dad <gasps> at that point, yeah, uh, was, um, was quite young, but the only male in the family. So here he was with his four sisters, his mother and himself. And so an uncle of his uh, decided that it was time to come to America. Uh, so when he was 16, he, came, he did with, with this uncle. Um, came to America and um, did anything he possibly could, and you know, and I'm sure there are so many people out there who, who are who have this kind of background, oh, yeah. uh, whether it's Greek or Italian or Irish or whatever. I mean, we, we or share Swedish. some or Swedish or right. Swedish. Yes, yes, I have um, very humble backgrounds. Yeah, we do have, and we have to remember our humble roots. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and so when he came, uh, he shined shoes and sold newspapers and did whatever he could uh, you know, to, keep, yeah. to keep himself going because his goal was to be able to send back money uh, to his family, his mm -hmm. sisters and his mother. And so he was able to do that. And, and eventually he, he started in the restaurant business washing dishes and so forth. And would always, he would always tell me he'd keep an eye on the cook to see what uh, the cook was using for ingredients. And every once in a while, he would say, you know, you had to, had to kind of sneak around because the, the chef would not necessarily want to know what, what he was, you know, putting in there. 
but he did, and uh, he learned a great deal, and eventually was able to, to start his own restaurant, and was very successful, very successful. Um, my mom, also from Greece, was, was from Asia Minor, uh, which is now part of Turkey. Mm. Uh, it was under Greek rule at the time, and, and uh, her story is fascinating also. Um, her father, my maternal grandfather, was a merchant uh, uh, in a coastal village uh, of Turkey. And um, very successful merchant who had befriended many of the locals who worked with him and so forth. Uh, his name was Pete also. And uh, one night, one of his friends who was Turkish said, Pete, take your family, get out now. Don't wait. Just do what you need to do and leave. And so under the cover of darkness, they did. And, and I remember them telling us that they put little gold coins in the kids' money belts. And they started walking. And it was uh, my mom, um, two sisters and two brothers, and both of her parents who walked out. But one of the, the really incredible memories that my uncle, who has since passed, had was turning around and, and watching uh, the Turks come out of the hills uh, on horseback and, and with scabbards and beheading their friends. And he, that, he said, I will never forget that, never forget that image. Uh, so the difficulty that they fled from was, was truly very similar to what people are going through today to escape this, this dominance by a, a, ethnic cleansing, whatever, however this is working. Um, and so they were able to, to flee with their lives mm, and get goodness. out. Wow. Uh, and it worked. It worked. Now, they met here in the States, in New Britain, Connecticut, yes. Did they meet in church? You know, I, 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 probably. <laughs> I, I, of course, I wasn't around at that point, but I think they did. Uh, that, that the church is so much of a social thing sure. as well, uh, as most churches are. And uh, I know my dad had, uh, my mom had caught my dad's eye. And uh, so it, it eventually worked out where they, they were married, and they had four of us, two boys and two girls. And it was like a, um, two families because my oldest sister and brother were 14 and 13 years older, respectively. Oh. Then I have an older sister who was four years older than I, who just celebrated her birthday. Are you the yesterday. baby? I'm the baby. I'm the baby. I was a spoiled baby. I bet you were. Oh, yeah, it was great. Those two was, sisters especially. Well, you know, one of them. <laughs> Although there's a story about a banana peel that I, I won't go into now that truly works. You never watch these um, Three Stooges where somebody puts a banana peel on the floor yeah, right, yeah. And, and goes up in the air and lands on their head. Well, that happened to me through one, my younger sister. And she tells that story with such glee and, and such, it, oh, it's, it's as if she's experienced it again. And now, yeah. <laughs> so wonderful, I got him. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, but I got her back uh, after that. But um, the, the roots of, of, of music were in both of my family, mm -hmm. uh, both ends of my family. Uh, my dad was a very accomplished, although self-taught, clarinetist and violinist and was able to do uh, some wonderful things with a very natural ability to play fiddle. My brother, who was a, uh, had earned a master's degree uh, in music from Eastman School of Music oh, in Rochester, okay. mm -hmm. uh, always said, you know, Dad, he said, you'd really upset me because you can do things naturally that I have had to study and practice and practice for years, and I still can't do them. And it was true. Um, mm. So the, uh, my mom also had a very interesting story. Um, when she was a teenager, she had a lovely voice, a lovely voice, and she sang up until the day she passed. Um, she accompanied herself on the piano. She was a terrible piano player, but she would get close enough to where she could sing and you could uh, you know, understand, yes, okay, so here it is. Um, but she was at a baptism or a wedding at the age of 16, and the band that was there invited her to sing, and she did. Well, it happened that there was a, a, a gentleman from RCA Victor in a, attending also, and he offered her a contract. Oh, my goodness. Well, but at this point, at 16 years old, coming from the old country with your mom and your dad, good girls don't go into showbiz, and she didn't take it. She couldn't take it. 
My goodness. So uh, that yeah. was something yeah. that was, I, I'm sure she lamented about that. Our for, path not you know, taken. Oh, my, yes, the path not taken. Yeah. And well, as, um, so uh, you, you, ha you grew up with uh, Greek food, Greek oh, yes. music, Greek mm -hmm. dance, right. uh, Greek stories from the old country. Yes. So it just led you naturally into pursuing, uh, uh, learning more about your, your heritage, and, but, but about Greece and the Parthenon. Um, and, and I understand that your uh, degree was in public relations. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Boston University, uh, but then you took a photography class in college, which just inspired you, and you have produced magnificent photos. I want you to tell us a little bit about your first trip to Greece. First trip to Greece, um, I was working with uh, the Bristol Press, which is a very old newspaper in my hometown, and um, at that time, there was an interest in twinning a city in Greece, uh, which had expressed an interest, and from which uh, many of the Greeks in town in Bristol uh, came from. And so it was the city of Kozani in northern Greece. And, um, and so as, as an employee of the Bristol Press, uh, I was one of the business people who was lucky enough to be part of this trip. And I believe there were eight of us who, who went over. Um, and actually got involved with the ceremony of twinning mm -hmm. uh, Bristol and Kozani, which still exists, and, and it's, it's a wonderful association. So I was able to, um, to get over and spent a week in, in Kozani, but also touring, excuse me, the rest of the, somewhat of the rest of the country. But we were treated like kings. It was, this this mm. was a, a wonderful experience and introduction mm. uh, where they took us to... Uh, many different historical places uh, to uh, to witness some of history. Um, I remember going into the, the tombs of uh, Verina where Alexander the Great's father uh, was buried. Um, and, and there's a connection with Alexander the Great's father, <laughs> who was Philip of Macedonia. Uh, and what I did later uh, with understanding uh, the Olympics, he, he had a, a part of that oh. uh, in ancient Olympia. But anyway, um, I don't want to get too much into that. Uh, so this photography course enabled me to take a few snapshots as we were touring the country and we went to, to various different places. Uh, and at the end of the trip, I had not visited uh, my dad's village. I, I had not been, been there at all. My sister and brother had. And so I said, you know, Joe Zerby, who was the publisher, uh, was in charge of the whole, the whole group. Uh, the mayor was there and, and so forth, and politicians and so forth. And he said, you know, Pete, he said, while you're here, he said, why don't you take an extra, an extra week and go visit your dad's village? And I said, oh, my gosh, this is, this is extraordinary. I, I would love to, certainly. And so they were kind enough to extend my stay on their nickel. Um, and so I was able to, to go visit my dad's village. And I took a train from Athens. It took three hours up the mountains. And this is, his village is, is called Apostolia, which is Apostles. And it's very near Delphi uh, mm -hmm. and the, the Oracle of mm -hmm. Delphi and that whole area, which also has a connection to the Olympics and several other pieces. Um, and so got to, got to his village. Uh, and it, and it was so mountainous, and I was able to, to relive, and I had a video camera with me and, and met my aunts and their husbands uh, and various members of the family who were still living at that point. And I always joke about, and it, when I do this, and I, I say this with the, the greatest respect, because I did do stand-up comedy for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> I can believe that. Yeah. Uh, as the baby. Yeah, as the baby, yes, absolutely. And I was on the road for years as a musician, and I did some stand-up, had a wonderful time with it. So I always joke around and say the only, I had an aunt who looked very much, very much like my father, except her mustache was a little darker. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, and people can relate to that because it, it, um, in any event, it, it's just kind of a fun thing that, that, that I have fun with, yeah. with meaning 
absolutely just, just fun. Uh, but they were extraordinary people who lived off the land. Uh, I had an aunt who had a great sense of humor. And, and as we walked around this village, she would look at one of the donkeys and say, there's my car. And I said, oh, this is wonderful. And, and this mountainous village uh, was so beautiful. How was your Greek? Not too good. But it you... still isn't terrific. I can understand a lot, but uh, I got by. And fortunately, the little Berlitz handbook got me right. through a lot of circumstances. It was, <laughs> it, it was terrific, but enough to, to actually you know, communicate and, and understand what was going on. They were so excited that uh, I was able to be there with them. And, and I took um, a bunch of video. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so you interviewed these relatives. Oh, yes. And your parents must have been thrilled. My your, dad, your dad. Yes. Right. Especially my dad. When I came back... Uh, he was in his 90s at that point, mm -hmm. um, and I played him this video, and he just he sat there. I must have taken at least an hour's worth, and there, you could see a little tear you know, just streaming down his face as he was looking at his sisters, and, and of course, they were talking to him in Greek, Gus, we miss you. you know, we, we, we miss you terribly. Please come and visit. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Did he, he ever he get would, back? No, he never did. Oh, from no. the time he was 16 <gasps> till when he passed at 95. Oh, my gosh. Never went back. He said, I want to remember this uh, as, as a child. Um, but his reaction to this video and seeing this was, he, he was silent for a minute, and then he said, you know, he hadn't seen him, of course, since he was 16, so we're, we're talking 60, 70 years. He said, they look old. <laughs> right, and I'm saying, oh, well, yes, that's true, uh, and they did. Uh, but it was so, it was so gratifying because he would play this sure. videotape uh, time and time again, and, and listen and, and see his friends and his family, and, and he would weep a little bit, and uh, you know, have what a wonderful gift you gave him. Uh, it, I, I, I like to think that. And, now, and was this trip a springboard for future trips and, and uh, your deepening interest in? Uh, the Olympics and uh, Western Greek democracy, culture. Greek Absolutely. culture, and all yes. of that. So let's get into that a little it bit. It certainly was. Um, so coming back from Greece uh, was was amazing, and this this trip um, really ignited something uh, in me uh, because as as a first generation American, also with both of my folks really wanting to be American. Uh, and they became citizens and so forth and worked very hard all their lives. Um, but as, as, as the, the baby of the family, it was different for me um, to try to assimilate what it is to be the first generation um, and an American. I am American. I'm an American Greek or Greek American, whichever way you want to mm. put it. But at the time I was growing up, um, it was difficult in the sense that our customs and traditions were rather were rather different. We would celebrate two Easter's, you know, because the Orthodox calendar right. uh, has it different. So I would bring Easter eggs to school <laughs> three weeks after the traditional you know, Western Easter, and, and al although it's the same celebration, it's just a different calendar. But there was also a time when. Uh, there was a Greek Independence Day parade in town, and I had to dress up in costume with my little white skirt and the little white you know, uh, socks and these big shoes with, uh, like Bozo would have been proud of, um, and this whole thing. <laughs> and it was difficult. I mean, they're, you know, okay, what am I? What am I? I'm, I'm Greek, but I'm... So anyway, um, certainly understanding that. The time came when, as an adult, I realized, wow, what a wonderful heritage. So coming back, uh, I was able to um, organize, and I had met uh, in, um, that was in 1988, uh, the first time mm -hmm. going. So right when I returned, I met a gentleman who became a very close friend and mentor, a fabulous photographer whose name is Michael Lawton. Now, Mike is probably best known for designing, machining, building, inventing a panoramic camera, which at the time, this goes back about 50 years, um, was an amazing, an amazing and unique format of a medium format and a, a Carl Zeiss piece of glass on this box that was about maybe a foot square, 
that sat on a monopod or could be suspended from a helicopter that rotated in two and a half seconds and took full 360 degrees oh my goodness. on nine inches of transparency. Uh, and with that glass, uh, we were able to, he was able to, I wasn't associated with him yet at that point, um, create these incredibly large and with perfect resolution images of whatever he was shooting. Uh, I, w I was mesmerized by his ability. So I got to know him. And uh, I, I remember meeting him at, at one of his uh, exhibits in Hartford. He had done some skyline shots of Hartford. He had been all over the world. And I said, Mike, I said, this is, this is just terrific. Um, and I, I very much uh, think this is something that would, would be of interest to, to Greece. I mean, the, the beauty of Greece and with its islands and so forth, uh, I thought was, was a perfect place to use this kind of photography. So uh, I put a little few bucks together and um, took Mike to Greece in 1990. So um, did you take that equipment? To yes, and absolutely. Can you show us something that uh, is, is uh, one of these? Would this well, be one? When, when we went, I wanted to get to as some of the, the tourist places that I felt were truly extraordinary. And uh, we were able to do that. Well, make a long story short, we came back after a couple of weeks and had some pretty remarkable footage. At that point, I took some of these images, and I don't have any here with me that, from that trip, but went to the Greek National Tourist Organization in New York City. Uh, spoke with their director and, and introduced myself and said, look, this Mike Lawton and I just came back, and this is some of our work. What do you think? And he said, I think this is quite nice uh, and quite unusual. It's unique. It's, we have not had this done in Greece before. So he said, would you consider going back to Greece if we pay for your trip, uh, your, <laughs> your flight and... <laughs> and everything um, to about 20 different locations and, and do this kind of photography for us. And I said, does Dracula have an overbite? <laughs> and so certainly uh, we, we did that. And um, this is one of the photographs. We were, we were able to, to cover so many different areas uh, from Athens to the Acropolis to uh, going north to Thessalonica to um, the, the uh, holy mountain called Ionoros, which is nothing but monasteries, uh, all the way down into the Peloponnes, which is the southern portion. So, so that trip continued um, to several other different locations, the Greek islands, Santorini, uh, Mykonos, uh, Kos, which is very close to Chios, uh, and Turkey. Uh, we went down into, through the Canal of Corinth, into what's called the, the Peloponnes, the Peloponnesos, uh, which is the southern mm -hmm. portion of Greece, uh, to Olympia. And it, that, trip, that trip was just an extraordinary uh, departure from, uh, well, not departure, but it had application because here we are now in 1992, and in 1996, Greek, Greece was vying to host the Olympics because it was, in fact, the 100th anniversary after the start of the uh, modern Olympics in 1896. Uh, and they thought it would be most befitting to have it back in Athens. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as a matter of fact, well, no. Um, it, um, it, it was a time when we could really take a lot of different different photographs. Uh, and a friend of mine who actually spearheaded that trip to, to twin the city of Kozani uh, had some friends still in Greece who said, you know, if you, if you have these photographs of ancient Olympia, um, we might be able to use them in marketing Athens uh, for the 96 games. As it turned out, it didn't happen. It was the Atlanta uh, Olympics. Um, they they won, but you know, Greece did come back in 2004 uh, mm -hmm. to have the Olympics uh, there. Mm -hmm. But part of part of this trip in ancient Olympia 
was so moving uh, to see where everything began in 776 BC mm. um, and the history and the origin of, of the Olympics, which obviously still continues today in Massachusetts, just saying no to it in Boston, which I couldn't agree with more because there's no reason to, to pay for it. Uh, so LA is maybe uh, mm. going to pick this up. Uh, and I already have my feelers out there saying, look, this is, this is something that might be of interest to promote. Uh, let me get back to this, though. So here we are within, in ancient Olympia. We probably photographed every inch of ground because there is such, such detail that still exists, although it's, it's pretty much in ruins. It was um, ancient Olympia was at the confluence of two, two rivers, the Alpheus and Cladeus and Alpheus rivers. And unfortunately, after many, many, many centuries, uh, there were floods uh, on the good side. Uh, that whole area was covered by many, many feet uh, of silt. And so it, it, remained, it remained a lot of intact, although it, w it was already in ruins because of earthquakes in that area and so forth. Um, and interestingly, uh, excavations that started in the early 1800s by the French <clears throat> through the Greek government until Greece realized that <laughs> the French were uh, excavating our, all these artifacts but sending them back to France. Mm. Um, and so they stopped that immediately and, and the Germans came in uh, and said, look, we, we will continue this our, uh, excavation and archaeology for you, um, but we will absolutely give everything to the Greek government. So they said yes, and this, is, this was terrific, and they, they decided to do that. So, um, but to begin the origins of the Olympics goes back to Greek mythology, and many of us we're taught this, uh, even, even my grandchildren today. Oh yeah, I know about this. I know about Zeus, who Zeus was, and, and so forth. And actually, uh, part of, of the, the myth um, of, of the grounds at Olympia was that sitting in, his, on t in this you know, magnificent gold throne uh, on top of Mount Olympus, he hurled a lightning bolt uh, and it exploded in the middle of Olympia. And he said, this is where I want you to build a temple in my honor. And so they did. Uh, <laughs> and these whole grounds became sacred grounds dedicated mm -hmm. to Zeus, Even, well before they were, were grounds for athletic competition. The word athlete, incidentally, is Greek in origin. It means one who competes for a prize. Oh. Okay. Um, in any event, uh, here is this magnificent... Uh, area, uh, and there were two basic um, venues for the games. Uh, one was the stadium, which uh, has a very interesting history, and the other was the hippodrome, where the horse races and chariot races took place. Uh, also wonderful interest in history there as well. Um, now, the mythology of the stadium mm -hmm which today is, is if you have a, um, a running track, the stadium is, is 600 feet in length. That's the standard. It was determined, and, and the mythology is that Hercules put one foot in front of the other 600 times and established the stade or the stadium, the, the distance uh, of that race. So that stade race of 600 and a feet uh, was established supposedly by Hercules. And uh, that track still exists. It's incredible. As a matter of fact, uh, the bottom photograph there, uh, you can see the remains of a vaulted tunnel uh, through which only the athletes and their trainer could come through. There were maybe 40 to 50,000 people on either side of the stadium. Now, the marble sills, uh, the starting points, are still intact. Really? Yes, after, after this long a time. And uh, it, it's pretty extraordinary. You can see in the middle of that photograph uh, the, the seats for uh, the royalty of the day. So the king, King Onomaeus, who was, was around at that time, uh, would actually sit there, and they had various judges. And in interestingly about 
the the first race, and there was only one event, but it was held every four years, and that interval became known as the Olympiad because of Olympia, uh, once every four years, uh, and it was that distance of running the state race of 600 feet. There was only a winner. No second prize, no third prize, nothing. Mm. You won or you didn't. You lost, period. Uh, but if you won, it was pretty extraordinary. And uh, actually today, the um, Olympics is, he is held every four years. Correct. Yes. And that dates back to 7 776, 776 yes. BC? Yeah, it does. <laughs> wow. As a matter of fact, yeah, they're, they're, uh, the, the grounds at ancient Olympia... Um, uh, and again, I, I, I have some some photos here that well, you know we're going can illustrate. to we're going to insert those photos. Yes, uh, wonderful in the talk. So mm -hmm. um, you can see this entire area uh, of of competition and where the athletes were housed. There was uh, the wrestling school, uh, the training areas. Uh, interesting about the the competitors, the. The one and only event, which was the stayed race in 776, and then from there it started to expand, and they added uh, a double stayed race, uh, so you would have to run it twice. Uh, javelin, discus, wrestling, um, uh, boxing, a very, very brutal form of boxing known as the Pancratian, uh, developed there later on. Uh, the equestrian events of, of chariot racing and so forth, uh, and it had a wonderfully illustrated history, uh, and that was a way for women to get involved because women were not allowed uh, in in these competitions. Unfortunately, they had their own, which was quite interesting. Uh, but um, th th there's a, a great story of uh, a woman who, uh, who whose family were were Olympic athletes. And so she disguised herself as a judge and got into the event. As uh, a man. As a man. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, at some point, um, with her dress was exposed uh, as a woman. Um, and they spared her life only because her husband and her son were athletes, but women were banned from from that point on. In other words, there would be a death penalty with that? There would have been if, if she hadn't, if her family hadn't been so successful as Olympian yeah. athletes. Yeah. Wow. Um, so th these games actually were a celebration of, of religion, the, the, to Zeus, the yeah. gods. It right. was a celebration of the gods. Uh, Zeus's wife, Hera, mm -hmm. was the first temple to be built on the grounds. There's still pillars left. Uh, from from that, uh, this temple to Zeus was built was the second or sh followed shortly, and it was a massive uh, building, mm. pillars uh, of marble and so forth. And the the connection actually between ancient Olympia and Athens. So we have the origin of the Olympics in 776 BC, and then the origin of democracy and the golden age of Greece around 450 B.C. Well, you know, that's um, was going to be my question. Yes. Uh, what, uh, how, did, did, were there any uh, fallout effects from Olympia uh, that uh, set the stage for um, their uh, democratic form of government? In a very general sense, yes. Uh, and I say general sense because uh, the, uh, there were so many wars going on in ancient Greece um, that the Olympics was an opportunity for uh, young men to be trained as athletes so that they could serve in the military. Mm. Um, that was so much a part of it. Um, and so that, that continued. Uh, and, and actually, the ancient mm -hmm. games um, were in existence up until 393 A.D. when the emperor Theodosius said we will not have any more pagan rituals. And of course the gods were considered, you know, it was all pagan. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were abolished and it went dormant until 1896. The Olympics in yes. Olympia? Yes. Oh my goodness, why yes. couldn't it have been, uh, um, you know, ded dedicated to, uh, you know, 
know, to uh, not to the pagan gods, but to the god, the Greek gods. I mean, well, they were. I mean the gods. <laughs> I mean God Almighty. You know, the the one God that that the Orthodox Church uh, worships. Yes, uh, it would probably had to have been Christian. Yes, that's uh, what I mean. Yes, so <laughs> it, it, it it just didn't happen at that point. Interesting. Um, there was so much going on at, at, at that time in Greece and, and Italy, uh, it was... Mm. It, it okay, just, so, what, so tell me, um, how did the democratic values and principles emanate from uh, the Olympic experience? Through wars. There, there was constant warring between Athens and other city-states. There were city-states throughout Greece, probably the most famous is Sparta. Right. So the Spartans and Athenians were always at each other, completely. Um, but these were ethnically identical people. Uh, yes. And yet they were How, they were having civil wars. They were separate. Yes, it's um, it's a matter of the city states being different from each other. I know. Yeah, yeah. Culturally, uh, food wise, I mean, if you uh, so many differences and. Of course, you know the common the common reason for most of uh, our wars today is over land. Right. You know who's and that certainly was the case. We want this. We want all of Greece to be Spartan. We want all of Greece to be Athenian, so forth and so on. And it came to a point where enough was enough. Athens at that point had defeated the Spartans um, to a point where there was a, a relative calm for many, many years, and one of the generals who was most prominent at that point was Pericles. Hmm. Pericles right. was, he was it. This yeah. man was a general, he was a statesman, he came from uh, a, a wonderfully uh, educated, well-educated yep. family, um, and the principles that he incorporated uh, in, in what was becoming the golden age were truly democratic. Now, the, the word democracy, again, has a Greek origin. Sure. And uh, demos being people right. and kratos being political power. Mm. So we have political power to the people, mm. not the kings. Uh, n no one else was in charge. The, this focus was on how did Pericles? Freedom. How did yes. he come to that uh, understanding that that was the best path for Greece? Well, he felt that you know you, you had kings all over the country; they were fighting each other, um, and it wasn't working. And so, when he realized that coming from his family again, Cleisthenes was was another uh, Greek from from which he came. Um, the ideas of individual importance. Mm. became prominent. And when he came about, when Pericles came about with his leadership, um, he said, yeah, we, this, is, this is it for the individual. What year was that? This was around 450 BC. My goodness. Yeah. That early. Yes. And Absolutely. yet today, in 2015 BC, um, I mean AD. Yes. <laughs> 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 we we have so many dictatorships, so many. Uh, look at North Korea, yes. uh, you know, and um, we and, and look at all of the dictatorships in Africa and in the Middle East yes. uh, or in the Asian, uh, Central Asia. I mean, why has it taken this long? Do you think to to convert people to something that is humane and in the best interests? Uh, is it greed by a handful? I think that has a lot to do with it, certainly. The power, you know, Edmund power. Burke said power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that as the Greek city-states were warring, I think uh, Pericles realized that, no, we're, we're not going to deal with, with anyone else in power. We don't care about you know, who wants to lead this the power has to be with the individual. And so the structure, the, the early structure of democracy uh, was called the Athenian Assembly. And at this time, um, there were 500 members of the Athenian Assembly. Now, did, did, uh, in order for that to uh, come into being, mm -hmm. uh, did Pericles have to ask whoever the king was or the emperor or whoever to step down? No. Uh, there, at that point, 
um, it, th that wasn't around any longer. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so uh, his influence of <clears throat> of understanding the importance of the individual uh, really was the turning point, and and, mm -hmm. and Athens was ready for it. The Athenians were ready for it. So he he was the one who most influenced. Uh, and has just wonderful stories about his orations at his fu the funeral orations that mm -hmm. that he spoke at and his quotes um, yeah, and paraphrasing him was if you were not a political person, forget it you know you weren 't part of society you weren 't a true Athenian you weren 't a true Greek mm -hmm. uh, you had to participate and so the structure again going back was this Athenian assembly that met um, on one of the seven hills of Athens, uh, and and it was truly representative representative uh, of each individual. These five hundred members were chosen by ballot. It was just a lottery, uh, and and if you had truly this desire to be a politician, to to be part of the structure of democracy, you could do that. There were ten tribes in Greece at that point, and so they had fifty. Uh, members from each of the tribes and and this group met frequently um, to talk about politics of the day, what was best for each individual, what was best for Greeks, Greece, what was best for Athena uh, and Athens and, and Athens at that time was truly the the, the powerhouse mm. in the country, um, so you had these these people meeting, but it was as long as you could get in front of this assembly and say something of interest, you had the floor. Hmm. How did, um, and, and what other countries did um, this form of government uh, influence? Any other democratic countries? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, yeah. they were the first. Mm -hmm. And uh, who, who Italy, came? Italy, and it certainly came to be somewhat of... of uh, it, Italy, you said? Yes. Uh -huh. um, and again, you know, I... I I don't want to misquote anything, mm -hmm. but but certainly it, its start was in Athens. Yeah, right. Um, of course, of yep. course. Yeah. Well, it's it's so interesting. Now you took photos, mm. uh, many many photos, and you've brought them here today. Yes. And we thank you. Uh, is there uh, several that you'd like to show in particular? That the um, maybe some of these larger ones so that people can see them, and Absolutely. Uh, and we will incorporate them in the editing process so that people have uh, a chance to see what you have to share. Sure. But I can tell you they are magnificent, Thank and you. they the clarity is so incredible. I feel when I look at this that I'm actually there. That and and to take this the next step, um, when I returned from. The first trip uh, with Mike Lawton, uh, which Olympia was a part of, uh, I put together a what is was in that photograph, which is a 20 foot in length, double sided, eight feet in height <gasps> presentation. Oh my goodness! Yes, and it, there were 16 eight foot photographs, not just uh -huh. two by right. Excuse me. So I put that together along with the history that I had uh, learned mm -hmm. uh, and uh, created this traveling exhibit called um, Ancient Olympia. Um, and where did it travel to? It, it started actually in Florida. I was living in Florida at the time. Mm -hmm. And so that particular uh, ex exhibit opened in Delray Beach uh, at the Cornell Museum. And oh. I was able to... Um, so did it do some uh, museum hopping? It did. It did. Did it come up north? It, it, it did come up north. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, it was in Newport. Oh, uh, I presented it in Newport. Um, and, uh, and so it, 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 it was a, a, just a pleasure to be able to do this. And one of the, one of the images uh, has one person standing uh, at, at the ruins uh, in, in Olympia. Um, and then 360 degrees later, or 361 degrees later, that same person is on the other side. Oh, my goodness. And you can see this so entirely. That's the panoramic. That's the panoramic. Right. And, and that was the uh, You want to pick out uniqueness. some of the larger sure. ones here? And, yes. Uh, should tell us a little bit about Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to jump between uh, Olympia and, sure. and what is uh, 
part of the part. I have to I have to back up just a little bit before I do this because okay. there, there is a, a, a very important element to how I was able to get to uh, Athens as well. Okay. Okay. And that was that I had met the president of the, the American Committee for the Reunification of the Parthenon Sculptures. Wow. Yes. Um, in any event, uh, he was able to get permissions from the Greek government for a this gentleman who is an attorney um, and the president of the American Committee for the Reunification of the Parthenon Sculptures, which addresses the issue of who owns the past, that antiquities that had been stolen or uh, under nefarious circumstances taken from their uh, country of origin. Um, and I, I met him at a lecture that he was giving uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and very exciting and, and a great opportunity. I introduced myself to him afterwards, told him I had done this kind of photography and that I would like to add a visual element to what he was doing in his lecture. And he said, hmm, okay. I said, Mike, what I'd like to do is to get into the Parthenon, which is, was banned in the late 70s, uh, and shoot from inside. The variable was because uh, there was a refurbishing ongoing. They had scaffolds and so forth, and we didn't know if you'd be able to access that. In any event, um, he was able to get the, the permissions from the Ministry of Culture. So for a dedicated week, uh, I was able to get into the Parthenon, and from sunrise till sunset, take these incredible photographs using scaffolding. We had a, a guide the first day, and after that he disappeared, so I was just like a little monkey, and you can see some of this, the scaffolding that- Well, that is, was kind of dangerous. Is, is in, yeah, it was, but I, I have no problem with heights, Great. and certainly if the workmen were Here, able me... to do this, uh, we could do it. So we have this area particularly where you can see some of the scaffolding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and now what, did yeah. We, what are we looking at? Oh, we're looking at the inside. Of the Parthenon. Yes. I'm, I'm actually up about um, 60 feet in the air on scaffolding. Okay. So for people who don't know what the Parthenon is, would you oh. tell us? Yes, absolutely. I know I have a photograph of the Parthenon. The par and again, I wanted to talk about the no, creation. No, define what the Parthenon is. Define what the, the Parthenon was um, a, a dedication to Athena, uh, who was the, the patron of, of Athens. Uh, she fought against Poseidon from a mythological standpoint, but she gave the people uh, olives, and they chose, supposedly, her over Poseidon, who could only give them salt water in any event. Uh, I thought he gave fish. Well, that too. <laughs> yes, that's, you know, that's a good point. Um, uh, uh, so this, this is looking from inside the Parthenon uh -huh. uh, through the s southern colonnade into, into the city. And it, um, it really does show what, what was and what is. And what year was uh, this built? Oh, uh, r between 450 Yes, and 432. Uh huh. Now, in the center of this BC. building, BC. Right. This yes. is what I, I want to bring out because yes. to think that uh, all this time has gone by and their uh, columns are still standing. Absolutely. It's just and amazing. If it, if it hadn't been for war and the Venetian army, it would still be intact completely. But the Venetian army uh, Those had something to do with it. They were a very powerful, uh -huh. very powerful navy. Okay. And. Um, and um, Here's another yes. one from Athens. This is one of my favorites from the top of the Parthenon. And again, oh, I know what Let's I was... Let's take a look at this. Okay. <laughs> okay, I want to show you this, but oh I want to... Oh, my goodness. You're preface. really up on the scaffolding, aren't you? Yes. And this is what people recognize as the Parthenon. Right. Now, if you look closely, you can see uh, a lion's head. I see. Okay. Well, we'll there, pick that up there, later. And you yeah, know, well, there are two of them. I see. And it, it pertains to this particular... And that was your photo? Yes. Yes. Uh, and it pertains to this lion's head, which is one of two remaining. Oh, look at that right so, here. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I'm on top, about 60 feet up the air, uh, looking 
And I, I'm very close, obviously. And, and here is the city of Athens. And there is this uh, place called Lycabetos, which is uh, uh, upon which there is a monastery and so forth. And what that's one this, of my favorites. What's this? Uh, that's Lycabetos. It's okay. another one of the hills. And that's a monastery up there. Yes, there is. Yeah. And, uh, and, it's and the a Greeks, site. their monasteries and uh, nunneries, they were always at the highest point. They were. Yeah. There's a, a place called Meteora where it's on top of these huge rocks. Uh -huh. uh, I just want to show one other, one other photograph quickly because now we're going back to um, Olympia. Olympia, yes. And if I don't know if you can get a, a tight shot, but I'm very proud of this. If you can, yeah, come in a little bit. Uh, on, on Which the one left, are you showing? Uh, the one on the left. Oh, here. far. Oh. This I'm standing one, the first up. One. You can see standing up on top of <gasps> of the Parthenon. So somebody else took that. On a, no, I. Well, someone took this of me. Yes. Right. <laughs> Absolutely standing on. Uh, you know, we're talking uh, original marble, 2,500 year old marble. Imagine. Uh, yeah. That yes, that um, was pretty extraordinary. So. And um, now we're going to go back to 776. 776 BC. BC. Yeah. And, and what do we have here? And this is the entrance to the stadium, uh, and it, uh, it is this vaulted tunnel which had, which had a top to it, uh, through which the athletes and their trainers would enter the oh, stadium. Wow. And you know, initially, uh, the prize was not a, a crown of uh, olives, it was an apple. Really? Yes. Now, the reason it was changed was because the Oracle of Delphi said to the king, after about six of the Olympiads, um, no more apples. You, you must find this olive tree on the grounds, which is just west of um, the altar for Zeus, uh, and, and construct a, a crown or branches and use those as. So this is the original. Olive grove. No, th uh, this is actually the stadium. Oh yes, wow. and you can see some people here. You get the perspective of that, but you can see a lot. Of, most of the tourists just go and have a great time. Yeah, and and, I, and those little specks are people. Yes, they are. <laughs> yep. Okay, and here we have well more of ancient the Olympia. the stadium itself. Yeah, let's hold that up. Mm -hmm. There again is uh, the entrance on. Oh, this on is this amazing! Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And uh, the Germans dug all this out. Yeah. Well, the French. Started in started. the Germans, yes, mm. and then, um, wow, there's, there's, wow. How are we doing? Time Good. Wise? Good. Okay. Yeah. And this is the temple of Hera. This oh, is the, the, Zeus's wife. This is where, it, yes, and that that one column here uh, is what remains uh, of of her temple. Now that was the first temple on the grounds. Right. And so, and it's in front of this where the parabolic mirror is lit. I see. To, to start the torch run from Athens to wherever the host city is. Wow. So this is done right outside of this. But this goes way, Isn't that way great? back. Now, how many acres does this uh, oh, cover? Oh, my gosh. Do you I, have I'm not any sure idea? specifically, but mm -hmm. it's, it, would take, it does take quite a while to get around this entire area. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're going to feature some of your magnificent photographs. And um, we thank you so much for all this marvelous information. You're entirely and, welcome. I mean, you're, not only the, your heritage and your parents, which is so nice to hear immigrant stories. Uh, I'm host of Growing Up in Easton, and mm. uh, we hear many of these stories. So we thank you so much. And, and you know, you're right. Uh, so many similarities, you know, where uh, people do what they have to do, hold as many jobs as they have to in order to support their families, and uh, the next generation is, is far more successful as a result. Yes. And is there one, may I bring up sure. just one other point? The connection, there is a great connection between Phidias, who was the, the greatest sculpture of ancient times, uh, and, and connecting to both the Parthenon and the Temple of Zeus. Phidias uh, constructed a 40-foot statue of, of Athena uh, in gold and ivory. 40 feet? 40 feet tall. Now, just to give you an idea of perspective, if you've been to Washington, D.C. and have gone in to see the, the Lincoln Memorial, Lincoln is 20 feet tall. So imagine 
twice that. So he really this. needed some scaffolding. Oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> he did. Yeah, and, and I hope he had some at that point, but it was just amazing for that to, to have been constructed at that point. Shortly after that, he went back to Olympia where uh, his, he had his little workshop and built another 40-foot statue in gold and ivory of Zeus. Now, what year was this? Oh, this is, now this is a little bit later. Um, this is right after uh, 450, around 440, 430, the dedication mm -hmm. uh, happening for, for both of these. It took quite a while. Yeah. It took quite a while for him to do both, but they're remarkable. Uh, and, and they're still these, standing today? No, they're gone completely. Gone completely. Yeah, gone completely. Yeah. yeah. In wars or however they were. One was a fire, uh, supposedly. And we see, we see today in Syria where ISIS is destroying oh. all the antiquities Absolutely. of that area, Absolutely. which is so sad. But it's a reality, and Greece also was victimized back then. Sure. And so sculptures and other art artifacts are... Uh, lost. But thank goodness Greece has a wonderful uh, history of uh, preserving its history and their museums are chock full of the past and Absolutely. Uh, wonderful to see and not to miss uh, on a trip to Greece. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I hope you'll come back someday and I hope. Uh, we'll, we'll have another topic, I'm sure, because you're such a multifaceted personality with so many interests. And uh, we want to thank you so much for sharing all of the, this information with us. I am, it's my pleasure. I've been, it's, it's a delight to be here and talk about. Especially uh, your enthusiasm and, uh, you know, for all things Greek. And uh, we wish you... Especially baklava. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, don't mention that. I got sick in Turkey on it. Oh, I had no. food poisoning. Well, see, it was Turkish baklava. It was Turkish baklava. <laughs> <laughs> They yeah. make great baklava in Italy. Yes, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate being here, and, and thank you to your audience for watching. And uh, it's been You're a welcome. pleasure. You're welcome. And I, I hope uh, those of you at home have enjoyed this program as much as we have putting it on. And so until next time, this is your host, Priscilla Almquist Olson, and my guest, Peter Yalanis, <laughs> wishing you all the very best. Thank you.